ब्लड डोनेशन दे तो जब तुम लेके आओ कर क्या रहे जिंदगी में तू कंट्रीब्यूट कर ब्लड दे के आ जिंदगी में तू कंट्रीब्यूट कर ब्लड दे के आ कर क्या रहे जिंदगी में तू कंट्रीब्यूट कर ब्लड दे के आ गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एम आई ऑडिबल Am I audible? Yes, yes. ma'am. So, ah, uh, we have ah uh, finally come up ah uh, to the one second. माई वॉइस वॉइस इज क्लियर पीपीटी दिख रहा है it's gone okay so uh it didn't need that abhi aaya start 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 so we are here on to one of our last books that we recommended we would be discussing and that is evidence based management of low back pain but before we get on to that uh we would like to hear from you guys if there's any of your favorite books any of your friends who would like to come up and discuss this on this platform you're more than welcome so any one of you guys who's interested in starting this uh, or continuing this uh, book club that we initiated which we are planning to keep it like say once every fortnight so that will be twice in a month any of you your friends who have uh, come up with a book who would want us to you know discuss this further uh, are more than welcome to ping us on the group and then uh, let us know later about this okay so uh we discussed three books in these three wednesdays uh which was aches and pains by louis gifford then uh, in that louis gifford emphasized understanding what are the other factors which might be responsible for the pain what is the role of your nervous system and how central sensitization makes treating pain more and more difficult 
but at the same time how simple measures can help you get optimal recovery in your patients okay not visible then, yeah not visible ppt hello ppt is not visible padne now should i share the ppt do you have it yeah i think i will share the pdf or something like that i send it nahi abhi aa gaya chal yeah ab isko change mat kar prajna so if i'm enlarging it then people are uh, then it's going yeah don't don't enlarge it don't enlarge it okay say rakh usko chalega yeah okay so uh, in first book louis gifford we discussed what are the simplest me measures which we can use to treat pain and what is it that makes chronic pain uh, more and more uh, effective in management okay in the second book we discussed about the clinical reasoning and what is its importance in our uh, uh, management and rehabilitation of our patients we discussed the nine hypothesis categories and i'm sure all of you must have started using them in your clinical practice and today we are coming on to discuss the most burning topic which i think all of us are more interested in knowing we face lots of difficulties in treating a case of low back pain so this book is by scott halman and simon daggins uh the intention of this book club was to uh rather we enjoyed reading these books and we wanted more and more physios to get aware about what are the uh, recent advances which are happening in the field of physiotherapy our intention was to help you make aware of these things and to make you uh, promote reading of these books and i'm sure most of you guys would have started doing this if not then i think it's still time we have shared the blog uh, website uh, website for uh, louis Gitt louis gifford we have shared clinical reasoning ka book and i think we have also shared uh, scott halman's evidence based management of low back pain so guys back up and start reading these and discussing and you're more than welcome to discuss any of the doubts any of the queries that you face once you read these books with us okay now moving on to evidence based management of low back pain uh me and yuraj were lucky enough to meet scott halman in person in 2019 when he came to india for uh, the world spine care conference which uh, was hosted by mgm and when we met him we realized how simplistically he has made uh, this book a uh, very 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 easy for every reader to read and to understand and to compare so uh, scott halman has a huge introduction to give and uh, you can go through the book i try to shortlist few of those but it's it's quite vast an introduction for a person like him but we knew him in person as the president of world spine care wherein we worked as a part of indian representatives and so coming back to this book the book talks about all probable interventions which are available for managing low back pain and the book is categorically divided into five sections description of that specific intervention what is the theoretical background behind that what is the efficacy what is the evidence talking about that specific uh, intervention how safe it is are there any harmful effects which are associated if you plan that intervention for your patient and very important the cost uh, the cost the expense that specific intervention is going to carry now what happens is because low back pain has become one of the top most uh, musculoskeletal burden across the world so whatever treatment you chalk out for your patient has to be cost effective and all of these uh, criteria are being considered for each and every intervention in this book now we definitely have come across with all of these and all of us have been using multiple uh, things when whenever a patient of back pain comes to us we definitely use core stability we use ultrasound tens yoga cupping dry needling taping 
all of these things are coming up uh, a lot in our uh, day to day management of low back pain but what is uh, important to understand is the bark of your low back pain is much more dangerous than the actual bite what does it mean there's a lot of noise around low back pain and various interventions which we keep on using without coming to a consensus as to what specific intervention would probably work in my patient the actual scenario wherein there is a threat the red flags that we discuss are you know almost around 1 to 2% not more than that and that's why you have to be very very uh, good at evaluating your patient and understanding and ruling out the red flags when you plan an intervention for your patient that's why we said that the bark is much more louder than the actual bite okay so when it's so difficult to come to a consensus out of the uh, number of interventions that scott has mentioned in his book we took out a uh, very very predominantly four categories which are very commonly used by physios in their management okay so we're going to talk about uh, the lumbar stabilization exercises or motor control exercises we are going to talk about uh, strengthening exercises we are of course going to talk about mckinsey and lastly we're going to talk about your electrotherapy as a modality for your management of low back pain so let's have a look on what evidence do we have for each one of these to begin with uh, we'll start with lumbar stabilization exercises so this book was uh, published in 2017 and all the studies that uh, scott has taken are uh, studies before that so we have uh, the book mentions about three systematic reviews and six rcts and based on these things we have come across uh, the following uh, things now what do lumbar stabilization exercises actually do as the word goes they these are meant to improve the stability in and around your spine they are very good exercises to improve your neuromuscular control they are very good in improving your strength and endurance and to maintain the stability component of your low back okay instability uh-huh. yeah ha theek hai do bar likhte ja okay likh to chahiye dandu to kar ha baaz mein aa rahi hai instability what we also work upon through motor control or lumbar stabilization exercises is uh, the active passive and uh, the uh, dynamic components of your stability okay now what research says where do you use these exercises so the evidence says that this specific exercise component or intervention is very useful in patients who have clearly defined anatomic barriers you take a patient you evaluate and you find there's lot of muscle imbalance or you take a patient you evaluate there's joint stiffness or there's an a very acute scenario wherein the person is just very scared of moving okay so where there are anatomic barriers to functional performance and the person is psychologically not vulnerable okay so we uh, when we discussed louis gifford we understood that uh, the vulnerability of the individual the contextual factors are clear cut barriers to a rec- recovery pathway for low back pain so when you don't have these as barriers your lumbar stabilization exercises would do wonders okay however so what we have written in terms of uh, the advantages so we prefer these in acute phase and in patients with high irritability bahut zyada pain hai the person is just not ready to move has developed lots of kinesiophobia there is lot of anxiety depression the other psychological components which are a lot lot high these patients would definitely benefit with these exercises as these exercises are supervised they are graded and they work a lot on neural plasticity so you have to remember whenever you are using lumbar stabilization exercises that these are the exercises which are bringing in a lot of awareness about the movement it works on proprioceptive element and kinesthetic awareness and thus bring about a change in your neuromuscular control so you would use these in these scenarios however however good they are they are non functional okay they you mostly give them in 
either lying position, so they are supine side lying. The carryover to functional uh, movements is not very clearly defined. There's lack of clarity in literature about how would you progress that specific person from supine to standing to his function. So if it's a high demanding athlete who comes to me, there are definite indications that that person is going to require movement in multiplanar directions. So how would you train that? That clarity is not there in literature. And this is something that is very difficult to train in individuals. So when I was a part of World Spine Care and treating patients in MGM, telling them, cueing them for motor control exercises was very difficult. It depends on the education level of the individual, how literate the person is, how would you cue them in their own language. That's a very difficult task for the therapist. So lumbar stabilization exercises has an evidence for your patients with high irritability and in acute phases, people who are kinesiophobic or have a lot of psychological uh, uh, fear about um, movement. What these uh, exercises would also do is build upon the foundation for your movement efficiency because they are motor control exercises. They are... Uh, the stepping stones for building up an energy efficient movement. So movement control comes very easily. However, uh, the research indicates that you need further studies to evaluate the benefits for uh, recreational and occupational demands. That's what we discussed. If it's an athlete, if it's an active individual who is requiring movement in multiplanar direction. So that multiplanar functional core training has not yet been researched in terms of your lumbar stabilization exercises. Moving on to strengthening exercises. We always fear from introducing strength training in our low back pain patients, okay? But what there was one systematic review and 11 RCPs which have shown favorable short and long-term results with lumbar extensor strengthening exercises, okay? Now, what happens, what is very important for us to remember is whenever you start strengthening exercises, the size principle. So, as you go on improving, increasing the amount of force that the person has to manage, the motor units start recruiting from smaller to higher units are recruited. So it's not that if I am doing a deadlift and I'm lifting, only my large fibers are going to work. My The small units or uh, let's say the tonic fibers or the fibers which I try to improve with lumbar stabilization exercises are definitely going to work. Along with that, I'm going to make use of larger fibers which will be required to work. So strength training is very effective in recruiting all of the motor units. It's not just the bigger motor, larger motor units which are going to work, okay? It has added benefit of improving your, uh, so the, it has positive impact on bones, joint stability, ligaments, and if it is used at optimal intensity, the endocrine adaptations which happen are also very positive, okay? So, if you remember, we have, if we have a case of osteoporosis, we say that body weight bearing exercises are good. So, you can begin with body weight as an exercise, but definitely use these exercises for your um, uh, low back pain patients because it is shown that it's not just the pain but the physical function also improves with this intervention when it is compared with other forms of exercises okay whenever you're planning a strength exercise protocol for your patients remember the principles of overload that you have to go beyond the current capacity of that muscle of uh, for that individual okay only then you will start finding benefits out of your strength training and uh, the specificity so uh, they have uh, researched about uh, erector spine and glute max as the muscles that's being studied in most of these rcts and uh, so specificity whatever muscle you want to strengthen you have to be very specific and target that muscle okay now, coming back to, uh, we have uh, bifurcated uh, the uses and probable uh, um, cautionary signs in, in every of each of these interventions. So, 
your strength training exercises are functional. They mimic your real life forces. So if I'm making a person do deadlift, I may not introduce weight in the initial stages. I might just use a PVC pipe and make the person just do the deadlift movement. What am I training? I'm training the person to lift something from down and bring it up. Okay. Which is a very functional movement, which the person is going to require in his day-to-day -day life. Okay. At optimal intensities, overload principle creates a resilient spine. We actually um, forget to tell this to our patients or we just generally do not emphasize this in our patients that you need to have a stronger spine if you have to work through your day-to-day -day activities. Okay. Strength training is preferred in your active adults and sports population. And when a person starts lifting weights, when you actually start introducing weights, it boosts the confidence of the individual. It creates a positive body image for them, which adds as a psychological benefit for them. Uh, when you come on to the cautions, precautions, uh, if you are not introducing weights in a graded manner, you probably run a risk of re-injury in that person. So if I have a patient who has... Uh, who has come to me with uh, acute low back pain, I probably start with lumbar stabilization. I move on to strength training. But I, if I do not respect his uh, weight uh, bearing capacity, whatever his initial uh, capacity is, and I introduced a heavy load, I am going to re-injure. You have to remember that every exercise, every intervention that you introduce to your patient comes with a risk-benefit ratio. So if I am introducing strength training, I will always weigh in an individual person what is the risk and what is the benefit that I will achieve when I introduce this. So if I'm treating an 80-year-old female and I want to introduce deadlift as an exercise, I will probably not start with 30 or 40 cages. I am definitely going to introduce that as an exercise, but start with the PVC uh, to begin with and then load it gradually as per her capacity so that I don't re-injure these structures. Okay. It's definitely not a preferred protocol if you have high irritability in the tissues. Okay. When the pain levels are high, when the person is kinesiophobic, you definitely don't want to start strength training because they have had heard lots of things from people that how weight is the thing which is probably going to harm them. So this is all about your strength training exercises. Use it with caution, but definitely make use of it because it has shown good result in patients with low back pain. Coming on to the most controversial and uh, most highly debated topic about uh, mechanical diagnosis and treatment, that's McKenzie. Okay, so we have systematic reviews, which were five, RCTs, three, CPG's clinical practice guidelines. So these are uh, the uh, clinical practitioners who are practicing across the globe. They have taken it from uh, Europe, Belgium, US. Their opinions about McKinsey as a treatment and assessment protocol. Now, what we forget when we talk about McKinsey is that we use McKinsey in a very superficial sense is what uh, Scott wants to highlight. It's a comprehensive tool which is an assessment as well as an intervention, okay? It's not just a treatment protocol, but it has its own assessment protocol, which primarily consists of directional preference, okay? Now, it helps us. What McKinsey does is it helps us to categorize the low back pain into three categories. So, it helps us classify the amorphous group of low back pain, which we are not able to probably put them into any specific category. So we all know about the classification that it's postural derangement and dysfunctional syndromes that McKinsey classifies into, okay? One of the good points about McKinsey is it provides an algorithm to manage patients with uncomplicated mechanical low back pain. So you have steps which McKinsey has proposed and if you follow those steps, you would probably be, you know, able to get if the person is fitting into your uh, straightforward mechanical pain is fitting into your centralization that whatever maneuvers you are doing on the patient is helping the pain to go more central or uh, is the pain is reducing with repetitive movements you would definitely like to use uh, McKenzie. The best part about McKenzie is uh, you know McKenzie was developed as a self-management self, -management, self uh, 
uh, empowerment uh, protocol for your patients. So he, uh, the baseline of McKinsey was the person has to tell you what specific position relieves pain and what position causes pain. So he would then suggest that whatever is causing pain, you probably withhold that for a time being and get into the position which helps you relieve that pain. And it educates your patients, provides a good baseline education that if this is probably right now not helping, then I should not do this movement. But what are the uh, the demerits or, or the cautionary things about McKenzie is dogmatism, which we spoke when we discussed Louis Gifford. Okay, Many of the McKenzie institutes came up with that you have to do McKenzie itself. McKenzie is the line of treatment for most of your spine pain patients. Okay. And they would then defer or refrain from using other interventions or they will look down on other interventions which were equally effective. As towards the end, we will come across that most of the evidence points that more or less all of the interventions that we use for low back pain management are uh, equivalent. Okay, So this biased uh, attitude towards one specific treatment and technique has to stop. As Louis Gifford pointed out, repeatedly pointing out one specific uh, direction for a movement develops fear about the other movements. Okay, so if I say my flexion is painful for me and I refrain the person from going into flexion, I am uh, taking away the most functional movement from that person or developing a lot of fear in the individual's mind that yes, probably this is not going to help or this is harmful for me. It has a limited role in central sensitization. We discussed this in aches and pains. Central sensitization, once it happens, doesn't follow a specific pathway. The pain is diffuse. You have uh, random aches and pains which are fluctuating in nature, doesn't follow any dermatome, myotome. So McKinsey as a treatment protocol would be very limited. Again, coming from aches and pains, you have much more better explanations to explain why a repetitive movement might help in XYZ patient. Probably uh, because uh, you have the context, the environment, which is more supportive, the therapist, which was much more, uh, you know, uh, confident or reassuring, which probably might show improvement. Okay. So this is about McKinsey per se. Now coming to our uh, most favorite uh, intervention, that is your passive modalities. Okay. We, we almost all of us end up using shortwave diatomy, ultrasound, IFT tents. And nowadays, there's a trend of using a lot of dry needling, cupping and taping for our uh, low back pain patients. I've highlighted the things, none of your clinical practice guidelines, none of your systematic review, none of the RCTs are showing any evidence for use using these modalities, okay? No doubt you use them as a uh, adjunct, but uh, they are not going to be the curative thing for your low back pain patients, okay? So when we discuss this in aches and pains, we realized why they are effective when you use them. So there's a lot of placebo which happens whenever any form of intervention has been introduced in our patients, okay? So there are... Uh, even in terms of dry needling, there are 19 RCTs which have been done and all of them have shown a very mixed review about their efficacy in uh, treating low back pain. Okay, so uh, these are four interventions which we thought are going to be more and more effective and more beneficial for us to discuss. But Scott has also gone in depth of uh, what is the role of... Uh, back school, what is the role of counseling, CBT, uh, what is the role of fear avoidance, what is the role of uh, your medicines, okay, the surgical interventions. The book consists of all of these interventions and what I would like to highlight here is amidst all of these interventions, what has come up to the surface which has better evidence or a preferred, uh, which would be used as a preferred way of treatment is exercises. You use any form of exercises. 
So if you are using your uh, motor control exercises, if you are using your strength training, if you are using um, any any other form of exercise, it's the movement which has shown to be much more effective when you deal with patients of low back pain. Okay, so when there is so much of difficulty, we really love this one uh, from Alf Natchinson, who uh, had discussed this, that I've been studying low back pain for the last 50 years of my life. If, and if anyone says they know where the pain comes from, they're full of shit. Okay, which is a fact. Okay, when we work with world spine care people, they realize they used to tell us that this is spine pain is like opening a Pandora's box. Every time you are going to come up with probably a new reason for the back pain, you cannot just label that, that my pain is coming from a facet or my pain is coming from disc. My pain is coming because I have a lot of muscle imbalance. And it's, it's very true that whenever you assess a patient or whenever you try to treat a patient of chronic pain or spine pain, you have to remember that you probably may not be able to fix it. Okay. So what is important is to realize uh, that you are just going to be a guiding element in your patient's life wherein you would just be able to show them certain self-management techniques, help them with any of these interventions which you feel are good for your patients and then help them understand that probably we may never be able to pinpoint the actual source from where the pain comes from. So when it is so, so um, vague and ever-changing platform, what we, how do you think we would be able to reach a specific uh, thing? So in one of the um, papers, uh, World Spine Care also came across, uh, has also come across with something called as Global Spine Care Initiative. Okay, so this is a care pathway. This is not there in the book, but we thought that uh, we would like to highlight these five steps, which are very important whenever you see a patient of spine pain. Okay, this the article uh, we will share. This is also written by Scott. And there are five steps which have been enumerated. The first one is awareness. Okay, create an awareness in your patients about their pain. What are the other influencers which might be affecting their pain and how you would like to uh, tackle them? Are those influencers modifiable, non-modifiable? So in clinical reasoning, we discussed the modifiable risk factors, non-modifiable risk factors. Help them understand uh, the probable prognosis. Make them, reassure them if there are no red flags. Reassure them that this probably would, is not as dangerous as they think. The second step is once you have talked to them, counseled them, you have to do a triage. So triage is screening for your red flags. Screening for, uh, you know, uh, cancer, osteoporosis, fractures, trauma, any other serious involvement, which might just... Uh, require you to refer the patient first to a medical practitioner or to an orthopedic surgeon. And if there's a clearance from there and you can then continue treating the person. Your assessment has to be thorough. So if you decide to use assessment uh, through your uh, uh, McKenzie, or if I decide to do a kinetic control uh, format of assessing a patient, somebody else wants to do uh, neurodynamic way of assessing the person everything is fair till you are ruling out the red flags and coming to a probable uh, diagnosis and a probable uh, assessment which is going to help you chalk out an intervention for your patient okay a thorough assessment if you're not assessing then you are probably just doing things in air you have to have a good assessment for your patients then it helps you uh, decide the intervention. So what is it that probably you would like to do as a line of management and how that intervention is going to give you the desired outcome with which the person has come to you. The goals with the expectations with which the patient has come to you, are they realistic? 
will you be able to help them it's very important so five steps of creating awareness triage assessment intervention and outcome okay so we will be sharing this paper with you based on this care pathway we came on uh, to the classification system which is very very uh, crucial for us to understand so they classified it into five uh, categories class 0 is no or minimal symptoms they might just have a risk factor so the person has a uh, person may not seek any uh, treatment or may just come to understand i i had a case today who had come a 21 year old guy who had just come that on and off i get this random aches and pains in my low back and at that time the pain is so severe that i am not able to move or i will just need to lie down so no or minimal symptoms assessment was quite clear i did not find anything which was you know very much contributing so what we realized is uh, we then understood that he was very low on his body weight he had lot of ligament laxity undernourished is the correct word lack of sleep okay and then he joined gym wherein he started just doing random weights as we discussed in the strength training principle you have to be understanding the principles and then introduce weights gradually so what we did we saw him today we advised him uh, certain body weight exercises for to uh, improve the endurance per se of the muscles and the back gave a good advice that he should see a dietitian start off with good food put on a little bit of body weight explained the importance of sleep so these are the categories uh, this is a category where you don't need to be an active uh, intervener and you probably just educate the patient the person was in final year engineering so he knew what exactly uh, he understood what i was trying to tell and when i told him that you don't need to come back unless you have done all of these uh, things for 2 to 3 months just continue doing the exercises go to gym talk to your trainer introduce weight gradually okay so that was about uh, the class 0 class 1 is mild symptoms minimal interference with function but no neuro deficit we see majority of class 1 and 2 people will definitely seek you know physiotherapy okay so uh, class 2 is moderate or severe symptoms interference with function and no neuro deficit okay we classically see zero may or may not come to you but one and two are clear cut straight forward cases for physiotherapy intervention from class 3 onwards where you start seeing a neuro deficit so myotomal weakness head sensory affection hai class for the severe uh, spinal deformity trauma or pathology so somebody who's come with a gibbous spine you know that it's a probability of uh, tb is there if you see infection fever associated with spinal deformity or you have spine related symptoms associated with systemic pathology you would definitely want them to go to a surgeon or a medical person and if he gives a clearance once this pathology is managed then you start seeing these people for your physiotherapy management okay so this classification system helps us understand how would you want to manage your patient and this becomes very handy when we, whenever we are treating cases of low back pain okay now uh, irrespective of whatever school of thought you belong to you might be a mckinsey person you might be a kc person you might be a crossfit person you just might be a pilates person you have to understand that have you seen these three things okay have you considered these three things whenever you are planning your management are there any red flags your triage becomes very important okay diagnosis dependent on whatever frame you are using as we discussed so if i am using mckinsey i might put my patient into either a postural syndrome or a derangement or a dysfunction syndrome if i am uh, looking at it through a kinetic control perspective i might just put him into a movement control issue okay so you have to come to a diagnosis and then 
what are the probable contributing factors as we saw in uh, like in that 21 year old guy the contributing factors were lack of sleep diet okay his uh, endurance because he was never been exercising and he suddenly started doing gym workouts so they were definitely influencing the pain these three things if you have sorted in your patient then your management becomes quite easy and you are able to do justice to your patient now uh, there were five questions which scott has highlighted towards the end of the textbook and we're going to deal with each one of them uh, right now with an example okay so uh, he calls this as a shop shopping framework uh, louis gifford calls it as a shopping basket approach okay uh, imagine you going uh, to a mall and when a, where you see a lot of things which interest you so our low back pain has come up something like that you have lot of things to seek uh, help from so they call it as a shopping framework okay there are five basic questions that must be answered the first and foremost which is very important whenever you see a patient exactly what is the intervention and what can i expect to happen if i decide to use it okay so i have a patient of low back pain i used kinetic control uh, assessment format and i found that there is a movement impairment so i see a person with low back pain with an uncontrolled movement in the lumbar uh, uncontrolled flexion movement let's say to be more specific okay so i diagnose this as a movement impairment for flexion in a person with low back pain okay what is what is the intervention that i decide to use i'll use kc i'll use movement control as a therapy for my patient and what do i expect i expect that uncontrolled movement in flexion should be corrected okay so this is the intervention that i have chosen and what do i expect out of it is a better movement in flexion now what is the second question that scott highlights is is there a reasonable explanation as to how this intervention is likely to achieve the desired result so if i decide to use kinetic control as a treatment modality for this person with uncontrolled flexion movement what is it that uh, would justify my use of kc okay so kc highlights a lot of uh, importance to your mobilizers and stabilizers so you have local and global stabilizers and then you have global mobilizers now these are the muscles which help you maintain and move, maintain the stability of your spine and help you move if i have to go in depth so for me uh, in a patient with low back pain my local stabilizers are going to be my transversus abdominis my multifidus the deep layer of multifidus my global stabilizers are going to be obliques my glute max uh these are the primary most muscles and my mobilizers are definitely my uh, hamstrings my erector spinae and my uh, superficial g max piriformis would be uh, one of the global mobilizers now if i evaluate this patient further my uncontrolled flexion might be because my uh, local stabilizers have gone into inhibition because of pain my global stabilizers because they were trying to stabilize the spine as well as control the movement that is happening have gone into fatigue and then my mobilizers which is my erector spinae my piriformis my g max my hamstrings are probably helping these poor guys of global stabilizers to move as well as to bring about a global movement to control the eccentric movement as well as to move the spine into different directions so whenever there is so much of muscle imbalance i anticipate that there would be some amount of uh, movement control issues which will come this is uh, how do i support this theory uh, so this is a current research uh, paper again we will share this and this is given very nice way of uh, whenever you are using motor control or whenever you are using uh, this stabilizer as a treatment approach how your brain changes happen how neuroplasticity come into play how uh, your exercises might just uh, be very very how your 
stability exercises would be very important. So we'll sh be sharing this article as well with you. Coming to the third question, which is, what do you expect uh, benefits out of this intervention? And how certain uh, are you that you will get these benefits, okay? Now, what are the expected benefits? If I'm using uh, movement control as a treatment approach, and if I'm going to work on my stabilizers, recruitment, I'm going to bring down the activities of mobilizers, what do I expect? I expect a better and efficient movement control whenever the person tries to bend forward. So the flexion control will be much, much better in my patient with low back pain. I would be able to get a good stability in and around my spine with improved recruitment of muscles. So I will start making my local stabilizers fire as and when they are required to do. Then my global stabilizers would be working only to do their work of controlling the eccentric range and my mobilizers would be working to move my spine in their whole range as and when required. How sure am I if I'll get these benefits? Okay, this is a very interesting question. So uh, what we highlighted is any technique in itself may or may not be effective. If you just take technique, technique. So if I'm just taking McKenzie or if I'm just taking Maitland. So Louis Gifford emphasized that Maitland, when Maitland saw the patients, the patients improved. Okay. Whereas when they, in their initial years, when Louis Gifford and all others were practicing with Maitland, when they saw, they followed the same technique. They followed the same uh, protocol, what Maitland used to do, but their patients did not improve so much or there was always a deficit in their uh, recovery process. So is it the technique or is it the person who's delivering that technique? And what is more important is the skill of the therapist. And when it is combined with the technique, it is going to give you a positive effect. So if you are confident in doing McKenzie, if you are confident in doing neurodynamics, if you know your kinetic control uh, uh, has got a better go and you are sure of reassuring your person, a patient, then you will definitely have the benefits that you aim from that specific intervention. It is very crucial what how confident you are in delivering that technique. The next one is, uh, what are the potential or known safety issues associated? And is there any harmful effect that specific intervention might have? Now, when we were discussing uh, kinetic control in the lockdown, I know we were grilled a lot through like, what are we doing exactly? Uh, aren't we pinpointing that you have this movement control issue? You have probably instability in your L5S1. Or you know your uh, transverses and multifidus are not firing as and when they are supposed to be doing. Or your obliques have gone into a uh, shutdown or probably they are overloaded. So what are we creating? In Louis Gifford's words, we are creating a lot of hypervigilance and catastrophizing behavior, which might just uh, because we are focusing a lot on impairment and we are highlighting the deficit to the person okay that yes you have a muscle imbalance yes you have a movement control issue but whenever you are discussing your assessment to your patient how do you manage or how do you control this this is in your hands okay so what do i tell my patients whenever i'm seeing a person with any kind of pain i tell them that my assessment definitely tells me that there's a bit of an issue with your movement control, okay? There might be just a little muscle imbalance here and there, which is very much manageable with good exercise program. The uh, conviction with which you say this uh, makes a lot of changes in your person's, uh, patient's thought processes, okay? If you say, Ki, yes, there's a movement issue, yeah, and you introduce fear whenever you are talking about that, you know. So uh, there are lots of people who say that I get a lot of back pain when I'm getting up early in the morning. And if you tell them, yeah, the early in the morning, the disc has imbibed a lot of water and that's why the pain comes. And then you're scaring the hell out of them. The person is not going to get better. You are introducing then a lot of catastrophizing behavior. You're increasing the anxiety. So... 
words create a lot of um, words have a lot of influence on how your specific intervention is going to work for the patient okay so i always tell them whatever deficits you have whenever i have ruled out the red flags i tell them that this is very much manageable okay and your back pain is not a serious threat i give them a timeline so if i have identified uncontrolled flexion uh, movement i'll tell them that probably we will just take 5 to 6 days of exercises wherein you will try and get this control back okay i tell them what the exercises are going to bring in how the exercises are going to bring in a change how they are supposed to control uh, the movement throughout uh, their day to day activities and when they know that they are in control they are in charge the fear factor goes down the hyper vigilance reduces okay so every intervention every technique is going to come with a safety and a uh, probable harmful effect it is up to you how you are able to reassure your patient coming to the last one which is very interesting the cost of a specific treatment and how that specific intervention the cost of that specific intervention comparable to other available alternatives you would see a lot of patients coming to you and telling that if you are trying to treat me with ift or tens at the x clinic is uh charging this much and your charges are this much you have to understand that low back pain is a global musculoskeletal burden okay and it comes at a cost because there are lots of absenteeism from work the productivity of the individual is affected the person is of course going to sit and count in a uh, monetary uh, aspect or from a monetary perspective if i go to a therapy how much it will cost so you have to remember that you have to make your patients uh as independent as as early as possible okay so any form of exercise intervention if i use it doesn't come at an extra cost so if i'm giving movement control i'm giving strengthening i'm going to see those patients probably twice in a week and rest they are supposed to be doing on their own okay but if i'm suggesting a reformer pilates reformer we have a fantastic machine in safi which is uber 360 which is a lot to do with uh, you know building up neuromuscular uh, coordination improves your strength endurance improves your um, proprioception okay very expensive okay aqua therapy very expensive again so it is bound to be an extra expense for the patient so what we did here was to discuss what are the patient preferences you explain them that these are the kind of treatments which are available with you let the person choose if he wants to choose out of it what is the therapist preference it is very very important that you highlight that these are the options available with me but what i would prefer and which is not going to be an extra cost for you is probably exercises or whatever is and what is the available evidence is there an evidence that if i train on reformer or if i train a person for aqua therapy my outcome is going to be faster so if i treat a person with exercise as an intervention for say six sessions is my reformer going to give me that same benefit in three sessions okay and if the person is affording if the person prefers that treatment then probably i would like to go for that this is where your evidence based management comes into play take into consideration what the person wants is the person ex- are you able to reassure are you able to convince your patient that uh, probably this is what you are giving as a treatment option would work for you and in spite of that if the patient prefers it then why not okay then you can go ahead with that so we've uh, summarized how we would like to go about uh, managing a low back pain patient start with the most conservative interventions exercise comes handy exercise comes at a bare minimum cost and exercise helps them understand that movement is going to help in the longer term okay remember that whatever intervention you choose there will be some trial and error in the management it is acceptable rather unavoidable if i choose um uh, 
KC as an intervention for a person and I did not get whatever, whatever I had accepted out of, expected out of that therapy, I might move on to some other intervention. So trial and error in your management protocol is unavoidable. Always remember that your persistent severe low back pain is less likely to resolve completely. Tell this to your patients, okay? If it's a persistent chronic pain, you may not have a complete resolution. And it's okay to tell this in the first one or two sittings, okay? They, then it helps you build trust, build trust in their minds. Like the person is at least honest with me. Sit and help them explain that the low back pain is multifactorial. We discussed this in chronic pain, in aches and pains. Okay, always emphasize function. So in that 21-year-old uh, guy, if I would have sat with um, lumbar stabilization exercises, it wouldn't have helped. He would have got frustrated because I wouldn't have helped him uh, uh, be more functional. His pain was not when he's lying down. His pain was not when he's sitting. There was no directional preference. The pain was just random. Okay. So give him a lot of functional exercises. Whatever patient you see, don't just go on focusing on pain management. Okay. Get them moving. Exercise is the uh, key for your successful recovery. Last and foremost, like you would definitely need a multidisciplinary approach in your uh, low back pain or in any spine pain management cases. You need to have a multidisciplinary approach with a biopsychosocial model. Okay. So uh, to summarize, we have to understand that no one technique is superior to others. If you read through the entire book of evidence-based low back pain uh, management, you will realize the RCTs, the systematic reviews, everybody comes to one consensus that no one technique is superior to others. So why do we stick or defend a specific technique like our lives depend on it? No. Okay. You have to move on. So I have done kinetic control. I'm a movement therapist. Do I just use KC? No. So if I'm a McKinsey certified therapist, why do I have to go and defend only McKinsey? No, I can be using other techniques. I use a lot of soft tissue mobilization. I use Pilates. I use uh, definitely KC, but I use a lot of strength and uh, strength exercises since this last two years. So sticking to one technique is definitely not going to help you get what you want to, uh, the desired outcome, okay? There are still many institutes and colleges which are still promoting only one technique and giving less importance to other techniques. This has to stop, okay? Let, uh, let there be a variety because there are lots of options. We discussed this as a shopping framework, okay? So let there be a lot of options from which you choose. But when you choose, you have to be able to rationalize. Ask those five questions to yourself whenever you're going to see a patient next in your clinic that what intervention I'm using is it going to be fruitful for my patient, okay? So the bias towards a specific treatment, a specific protocol has to stop, okay? We have to be open to different things. I, uh, When Scott had come to India, we attended his uh, lecture and he at his age was very much, uh, you know, uh, prudent enough to say that what I'm talking today may not be relevant tomorrow. So why are we sticking to a specific technique or a protocol uh, like this is the end of the world? No, everything is probably going to fall apart. When we started as physios, uh, we used to just give static back as an exercise for an acute disc. Okay, now we have neurodynamics, now we have uh, KC, now we have Pilates. So you have to be accepting the change that is happening. And you have to be very vigilant of using these techniques uh, in your patients. To end with, yeah, Yuraj, you want to say something? Yeah, the same thing what Pradhina you were saying is that the, uh, I, think, I think the most scientific way of looking at low back pain is to use, uh, be open-minded and use all forms of exercises uh, we in positive we are using 
strength and conditioning or using a bit of kinetic control or using a, a bit of mckenzie and I, i i think when people defend one technique the most scientific way is to actually be open to all techniques i think that is the message which we want to to say i think one other point which i want to make and which might make people uh, uh, more tempted to read this book or print this out because we have shared the pdf already is that uh, scott has also compared uh, uh, exercises the, the other interventions for low back pain also such as the medicines the surgery yeah. the cbt and the other things which are the paracetamol versus the steroids and gaba pentine so it's it's very interesting to see where does exercise stand in respect to taking paracetamol for low back pain you will be surprised that uh, uh, exercise is far more effective in treating chronic low back pain compared to any of the medicines which have been suggested or any of the surgeries which have been suggested and at times when we feel bad about not having enough evidence for exercises or not having enough any evidence we should we should know that the techniques which the orthopedics are suggesting have far fewer evidence compared to what exercise is having so laminectomy has very poor evidence in chronic low back pain but still people are using it and jabki exercise is having great evidence so keep that in mind and it it will be fantastic if you read this book uh, in addition to louis gifford's book because this this two will add up quite nicely pratnya yeah so uh, this one i really like from paul ingram's uh, blog that i had picked this up and i think we need to remember this that has anybody no has nobody noticed the embarrassing fact that science is about to clone a human being but it still can't cure the pain of a bad back and this is a fact so we we need to be open we need to be evidence based we need to be understanding what we are doing with our patients and be able to justify that uh, so i guess yes uh, have a good read if you've not started yet with all of these three books and when you combine them you discuss them and you start using them as a treatment uh, uh, interventions in your clinics you would definitely be much more uh, uh happier as a therapist as a clinician because when we started using after louis gifford i think our uh, perspective towards looking at chronic pains and uh, all the aches and pains changed drastically so i would still again and again recommend that please start reading these books and uh, you are free to uh, recommend us any of the books that you guys would want any one of you your friends would want to come up with uh, otherwise what we are planning to do after a fortnight is either on ace uh, sports performance enhancement uh, we have priya with us who's done this course and we would like to discuss this in our uh, forthcoming book club if we don't uh, get any of your uh, volunteers or else we have crossfit with us uh, which yuraj has done and we would like to discuss what we learned out of these two uh, specific courses and how they changed our outlook towards rehabilitating our patients anything else anyone else volunteering uh, we are more than happy we have lots of seniors in this uh, book club here and we would request them to come up with any of their suggestions uh, which they would like to discuss yeah so any questions guys no how do you see pradnya manual therapy in this context what what was scott saying about manual therapy with respect to evidences so uh manual therapy yeah manual therapy uh, there were again a lot of mixed manual therapy again there were lots of uh, mixed reviews uh, which we received but uh, there have been lots of uh, spinal manipulations and mobilization techniques which have been found to be useful and i think the basis of those being useful is on the neurophysiological aspects of manual therapy uh, which we discussed in uh, aches and pains um, 
they they propagate uh, use of uh, so it was a moderate evidence for manual therapy yeah any more questions okay so i think uh, we end the discussion here but what i would like you guys is to come up with suggestions on the group we will be sharing the pdf uh, of this presentation uh, we will be sharing we have already shared the book on the group we will also be sharing the gsci articles and uh, the uh, classification and a uh, few of the articles which we found to be useful uh, whenever you are treating uh, Uh, with any of these interventions so we come to an end and looking forward to meet you guys after 15 days with a book of your suggestion we look we really looking forward to it it has been a great learning experience for us uh, while we went through these books and discussing these things with you guys bye